رسوله الكريم أما بعد ربي شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل رقدة من لساني يفقه قولي يا ربي سلي وسلم دائما أبدا على حبيبي كخير الخلق كلهم My respected elders, my brothers and friends, mothers and sisters, today on Sunday we have in the month of Ramadan Q&A session. Whereas after Ramadan or before Ramadan, this Q&A session runs on weekdays and Wednesday. And we will see how it goes in the month of Ramadan. We can always change and alter our programs here and there. So in today's session, we have received some questions some from brothers. <clears throat> the foremost question of today's ses- session is someone asked and Mawlana Sahib I have read in various places that to conduct Majalis of Zikr and Drud Sharif where there is Elan an advertisement is contrary to the Sunnah and in actual fact it is a bidat. So I would like to just shed some light on this topic <clears throat> because many a times people raise fingers and point at this topic of having majalis of zikr in the Masajid, as here the questioner saying, I've read it, it is bidat innovation. So I thought, in this very limited period of time, just I would like to quote some ahadis of Professor Allahu alayhi wa sallam. Ahadis from Sahih al-Bukhari, Muslim, Musradi Ahmad, Ibn Majah, and Tirmizi, and other books of Ahadis. Now, he, he who says that these majalis of Dhikr which take place in the Masajid is bidded, this is because of their ignorance. They have said this lack of knowledge. These majalis of dhikr have been proven these of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Authentic ahadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there are two issues here. Majalis of dhikr and making elan. You know, you know, someone has declared both as bidat. So let me quote some ahadith to you for Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then you will decide whether they are bidat or it is sunnat to have these majalis of zikr and remembrance of Allah in the masajid. They can, many ahadith can be found in this topic, many. Just for example, I have just, you know, I'm just going to present to you very few ahadith because of the limited time. There's a hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu and this hadith has been quoted in Muslim Ahmad, Muslim, Tarmizi. The words of hadith are Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Abu Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu. They both testify that we both heard Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying La yaqudu qawm 
in this hadith which is in the in the authentic uh, books of hadith prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying when a group of people sit in a place to remember allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so then what happens illa hafat al malaikatu the angels come and they surround these people who are sitting in this gathering of the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then the rahmat of Allah descends upon these people and the tranquility descends upon these people and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the mention of these very people who are sitting in the masjid doing zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they are being mentioned in the heavens Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about these people in front of the angels Another hadith of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that qala, qala Allah ta'ala, yaqul Allah ta'ala, Allah says, ana inda dhani abdi bi wa ana maahu idha dhakarani fa in dhakarani fi nafsihi dhakartuhu fi nafsihi wa in dhakarani fi malain dhakartuhu fi malain khayr minhu. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the hadith of Qudsi. Hadith of Qudsi, the definition of this hadith meaning that hadith, a Prophet says that Allah said this. It's not the Quran, but Allah says, the Rasulullah says that Allah said this. Allah is saying that I treat my slave according to how he thinks of me. You know, if we think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you know, he will have mercy upon us, he will guide me, he will, he will give me tawfiq to do his ibadat and uh, in, in his obedience, I will obey him according to his expectation and his thinking Allah will, will, will treat him. So we should always you know, think of Allah good, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, will guide me, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have his mercy upon me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if I, if I have fallen into difficulties Allah will open the way for me, you know, Allah will make a way for me you know, to come out of this difficulty. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, When my slave remembers me, I am with him. When he is remembering me, I am with him. When my slave remembers me in his heart, then meaning in a, in a privacy, in, in seclusion, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I also remember him in my heart. You know, I remember him. I don't remember him in the majlis. I remember him, you know, I myself remember him. And then Allah says, When he remembers me in a gathering, then I remember him and I make his mention in the gathering which is better than him. Meaning in the gathering of angels. So, If these gatherings were unlawful, if these gatherings were unlawful, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention such people in front of the angels if, were, if this gathering was unlawful? Now, the meaning is, these gatherings are not unlawful, these are the gatherings which are recommended by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These are the gatherings which are appreciated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For this very reason, Allah mentions us, whoever remembers Allah in the gathering, then Allah remembers us in the gatherings of angels. And now let's come to another hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this hadith is in the Bukhari. Remember, this hadith, I've just quoted you know, this hadith is in the Bukhari, it's in the Sahih Al-Bukhari, it's in Muslim, and it's in Farmizi, and the Sahih and Ibn Majah. And another hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is also in the Bukhari, that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna lillahi malaikatan yatufuna fi tuluki yaltabisun ahla dhikri fa idha wajadu qawma yadhkuruna allaha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed some angels and their duty is the roaming around. You know, they go and roam, and roam about and here and there just to find and just to search for, to, for those people who are sitting in the gatherings of, of Zikr. When they find such gathering of people who are remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they call one another and say, Let's come here, sit with these people. They are remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then they go and they present the full, re full report to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then there's another hadith of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when 
This is also in the authentic books that Rasulullah once passed by a group of Sahaba in Kiram who were sitting. Rasulullah asked them, why are you sitting here? They said, in this, in the form of a circle, they said, we are remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, well, Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam just came and he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is remembering them, these people in his gatherings, meaning the gatherings of angels. And so my respected brothers, these gatherings which take place in the Masajid of Zikr and the Sharif, they are not better, they are not innovation, but they are according to the Sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Secondly, so the, the question is saying, making an alarm. Now, there are so many forms of calling people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When a Mu'adhan gives azan, he's calling people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When someone goes to your house and knocks on your door and calls for the namaz, he's calling you towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When somebody is doing a bayan, he's calling people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's giving dawah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to, to his deen. So when somebody stands up in the masjid and says, oh my brothers, come and sit in the majlis of zikr, or oh my brothers, come and sit on the, in the talim, or oh my brothers, sit in this session of zikr, or in this session of the so he's calling people. So calling people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can this be bidat? You know, this is lack of a knowledge to say this is bidat. You know, it's very, it is very easy to say something, this is bidat, this is bidat, but to prove that it is bidat from the Quran and Hadith, you will not be able to do it. You know, if you if you want to declare something as bidat, you have to prove it from the Quran and the Hadith. You know, don't make a you know, don't make a haste in giving a decision of something that this is bidat. Oh, this is shirk. You know, in this day and age, people you know very quickly make a decision of this is shirk, this is bidat. You know, if if something from the Quran and the Hadith have been proven to be bidat and shirk, then that's fine. You know, we have to go. But, according to it. But if something is not proven, but it's, it's proven contrary that, you know, it is proven that this thing is established. So, you know, anything that is established by the Sharia, you know, it's wrong to say this is bidat and this is uh, against the Sunnah. So, the Zikr Madalis and the Masajis which take place, or the Trushri Madalis, Madali, they are not bidat, rather they are recommended, they are encouraged, it is Sunnat of Sahaba Ikram. They used to sit on, in the gathering and they used to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone asked, uh, well, in Deen, you know, there's no sh shyness, hesitation in Deen. Somebody asked, is, uh, is oral? sex halal. Let me just give you one example. Once we were in the class of Abu Hadrat Murayi Sumbutara Rahmatullahi and he said, you know the fluid which comes out of your mouth, your nose, is pak, is clean. Okay? If he, if he goes on your clothes, it doesn't make your clothes unclean. But nobody, nobody licks this fluid which comes from the nose. Does, does anybody does that? Nobody. Similarly, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when the women are in their monthly period, period, don't go them, near them, meaning don't have sexual intercourse with the women in that period. Now having, you know, a licking of you know, a private parts, you know, the tabiyyat, mizaj doesn't accept this, it's not recommended, it's disliked. Just similarly like you won't lick the fluid which came out of your ma nose. You won't do it, it's sparky, knowing it is park, it is clean. But nobody does that, nobody, you know, nobody licks it. So how can, you know, if somebody is in the, you know, having sex with his wife and he's licking his private her or she's licking his private parts and the fluid will come and they will go in the mouth. And this very mouth through which we do the recitation of Quran, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is, you know, why this is, in our youth, this is very common, now it's creeping into our youth and they're asking this question, why? Because they watch these films, you know, these dirty films, and from there they catch all these things, these diseases, and they want to adopt all these things, and then they come and they ask. It's good they're asking, you know, the, what is the ruling, the ruling, the Islamic ruling is, it's just not recommended, you know, it's just, you know, just avoid it. <coughs> Uh, someone asked this question, it's urgent, but it's, well, I've answered this question before in one of my sessions. Did the Prophet allow killing of children? You know, the, the wife, Banu Qurayza. You know, if you look at my those answers, I've, in details, I've explained it, you know, so I don't need to go over it again. I've explained that issue. 
of the Banu Quraiza, you know, who betrayed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I mentioned in that talk that, you know, how foul language, you know, the, the people of Banu Quraiza used against Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I've explained everything that, you know, I don't need to go over this again. <coughs> Now, someone asked you, what will happen to non-Muslims who never heard of Islam? And I heard that they will be tested in the hereafter. If this is true, then what is the point of them living in this uh, uh, life? Well, I and you don't decide. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them. <coughs> now, the, question, the answer to this question, someone born handicapped, disabled, dumb, deaf, doesn't know or blind and this hadith prophet وسلم, such people will be presented to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know the, the one who were born disabled you know they were dumb deaf blind never heard anything about islam and these people will be presented to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the people who to whom never ever the dawah reached so what will happen to them on the day of judgment rasulullah says such people they will be presented to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the, those crippled and the disabled, Allah will say, what have you done in, the, in dunya? They say, Allah, look, I, I could not believe in you because I was blind, I was deaf, I was disabled, nothing, I never heard anything about you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, well, that's fine. I'm going to ask you to do something now. They say, Allah, yes, go ahead and tell us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to these people to whom the, the Dawah of Islam never reached, or the people who are disabled, Allah will say to them, well, here is the Jahannam, go jump into the Jahannam. Go and jump into Jahannam. They will go and they will see the burning fire, they will come back. They say, Allah, how can we do this? We will go and we will burn. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to them, you are rejecting me now, you refused my order now. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to them, and you go throw these people into Jahannam. Now while I am in front of them, I'm saying to them, go and jump into the fire. And they have, you know, they, they disobeyed me what they would have done in the dunya. So this is the answer. This is the answer. The people to whom the, uh, the, uh, the Dawah of Islam have reached or people who are born disabled, never heard about Islam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment will test them. And the question is what a point, what is the point of them living in this dunya? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them. He is the creator. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his work, there is a hikmat. You know, I and you don't decide who lives and who dies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, me and you don't have uh, this authority right and say, oh, why are they living in this dunya if they are going to be tested in the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them and Allah knows best why he, they are living in this dunya. I don't, me and you, Allah won't ask us in the day of judgment why they were living in the dunya. But we need to do fikra for ourselves why we are living in this dunya. <coughs> And does the Quran in the fourth verse of Surah Talaq allows marriage to girls who have not hit puberty? Well, you know what he's saying in the Surah Talaq in the, the fourth verse of Surah Talaq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about divorce, those women, you know, who were divorced. And the women, you know, whose monthly period, period just ceased, you know, they, and they, because of their advanced age, old age. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I mean, when a woman is, you know, when a woman, normally when a woman is divorced, so she has to go into a waiting period before she can marry anyone else. And that waiting period is three monthly, you know, those three uh, monthly periods. When the three monthly periods pass by, then this woman, she is allowed to marry someone else. So if a woman who, because of her old age, and she was, uh, she was given divorce by her husband, so she, I mean, I mean, she doesn't have, she doesn't have the monthly course, you know, the, so what she, she should do. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is over there saying that you know, she should, you know, she should count three months. And after three months, then she is allowed. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, those young girls who, you know, who have not hit, you know, the puberty, they're under age yet. So this person is asking, you know, this verse is, you know, so they also have to count three months. So. Now in Islam, you know, the marriages of uh, underage, you know, the girls who have not hit puberty, they have reached that age yet. So is their marriage allowed? Yes, they can marry. You know, their parents are allowed to marry them. You know, they can do the nikah. But when they hit the age of puberty, 
then they will have the cho choice in order to maintain the nikah or cancel it. So marriages of the young girls or boys in Islam, it's allowed. Just a nikah I'm talking about, just a nikah. Not going to the husband's house, just doing a nikah is allowed before the age of puberty. This is allowed in Islam. So, I mean, so if, say, if the girl was married, you know, an underage girl, you know, who, who did not reach the puberty period, and she was married by the parent, just nikah was done, and this period, the husband, the, the clock was given, so she has to, even she still, she still has to wait three, three months. Three months. So, the nikah of the young girls who have not reached the age of puberty is allowed in Islam. <coughs> And during the Ramadan, can you still have sexual intercourse with your spouses after iftar and before suhoor? Yes, you can. And the background to this is when in the beginning, when the Ramadan's fasts were prescribed, and the, the beginning time of fast used to be after iftar, after iftar, as soon as someone slept, his next Rosa fast would begin. You know, it was very hard. You know, all day long somebody fasted. When iftar came, so now the timing is suhoor, you know, dawn. When the dawn breaks, then we stop eating. So in the early days, when the fasts were prescribed, what happened? Well, after iftar, when someone slept, then his next Rosa started. What happened? One of the Ansari all day long he was working in the fields he came home and it was iftari time and there was nothing at home to eat and his wife said well wait till i go to some of my neighbors and get something from there so that you could have it so while she went to get something he all day long he was working you know a farmer he was working all day long you know he was tired he went to sleep now what did what, what did this mean his next rosa started Yet he has not even opened his first rosa because there was nothing at home to open it. So his wife just went out to get something from the neighbors. When she came back, and he already had slept. And the ruling was, whoever goes to sleep, his rosa starts. And some Sahaba Ikram, what happened after iftar? They slept, meaning the rosa started, and they had intercourse with their wives. So if the Sahaba Ikram were going through hardships, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy came in, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed. So, in the nights of fasts, now you are allowed to go to your wives and sleep with your wives and have sexual intercourse. So after iftar, till suhoor, you know, to sleep with the wife Islamically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly, in clear words, in a surah al Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with this issue that you are allowed to have intercourse with your wife in the month of Ramadan at night after iftar till suhoor. <clears throat> uh, someone asked here, uh, what is the ruling for a hufaz who does not who do not have a fist length beard and leads travi well according to you know, Hanifa Rahmatullahi, whosoever beard is less than the fistful, you know, reading the Bible behind him is Mukhu, whether he reads Tanavi prayer or other form prayers. <clears throat> uh, someone asked here, sometimes at work, I, I do my prayer alone. I'm asking if, do I have to give Azan? An ikamat. So the masala is one Sadrate Ibn Masood radiallahu ta'ala who he read namaz at home with Hadrat Al Qama and Hadrat Aswad. And Azan wasn't given. So after the Adhan, after the prayer, they asked Hadrat, how come you never gave Azan? You know, we read namaz at home, so no Azan was given. He said the Azan which was given in the masjid. In the masjid, of, in the local masjid, is enough for us. So, which means, if when we read nawaz at home, 
in our masajids azans are given so we don't have to give azan at home because these azan which are given in the masajid are sufficient for those people who are reading namaz and doing namaz at home or they're reading alone individually <clears throat> so you don't have to give azan when you when two people are reading at namaz at home but if some if you give if you give ikamat the ulama they say it's better to give ikamat but you don't have to give azan because azan already has been given in the although although ikamat is has been given but the ulama they say but one should give, if two people are reading at home or one two or three then they should give ikamat but they can't avoid giving azan because azan already has been given the purpose of azan is to call people for towards the namaz you cannot give namaz at home give azan at home you know calling people because it's you know, nobody is allowed in your house to come to the namaz so in masjid we give azan we call people come to namaz so this has been done so at home you don't have to give azan or at work you don't have to give azan in ikamat if you read namaz at home so I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this session. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina wa maulana muhammadin wa lalihi wa sahbihi wa barik wa sallim wa rabbana atina fi dunia hasanatu wa fil akhirati hasanatu wa kina dhabu al-nar Allahumma rabbana taqabal minna inna kanta sami ula alim wa tubalain inna kanta tubawa al-rahim wa sallallahu ta'ala la khayr khalqihi muhammadin wa lalihi wa sahabihi ajma'in bi rahmatika ya Allah.